Hi folks, I'm Jim Papandrea and welcome back to The Original Church. Now this is a big question and one that caused a lot of division over the last 500 years. Did the original church practice infant and child baptism? First, let's remember that baptism is a sacrament and in the original church a sacrament is not something that just commemorates a past event. It is something happening in the moment. The recipient is changed forever. Remember Paul's words in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. So yes, the original Christians did believe in baptismal regeneration. Peter himself says so in 1 Peter. He says, baptism now saves you. The Protestant Reformation criticized the idea of baptismal regeneration because they couldn't separate the idea of regeneration from the idea of perseverance. They thought that baptismal regeneration would mean a kind of guaranteed perseverance. Now, ironically, some of them later made personal decision its own guarantee of perseverance. But actually, baptismal regeneration does not guarantee salvation. Baptism, as I always say, is a clean slate, but it's not a free ride. It washes away original sin and past sins, but it was never believed to wash away future sins, sins that hadn't been committed yet at the time of the baptism. So this idea that baptism now saves you, well, that is baptismal regeneration, but it is not a guarantee of perseverance. In the original church, it was always believed that even if you are baptized, you can lose your salvation. Baptism is the beginning of your journey in Christ, and in baptism, we receive the grace that we need to start that journey. But it was never believed to guarantee how that journey would turn out. The problem is that the Protestant Reformation changed the definition of conversion. In the original church and through the Middle Ages, conversion meant changing uh, to a new lifestyle from pagan to Christian. And that change of lifestyle, it's a lifelong process and it includes the concept of sanctification growing in holiness. Conversion and sanctification were always thought to be part of one process that leads us toward salvation. But the Reformation turned the idea of conversion into a logical decision that you make in your head, not from pagan to Christian, but from Catholic to Reformed. That is, a decision to accept the logic of a new way of looking at scripture and theology. And eventually, some Protestants reasoned that you can't make that decision until you're a certain age. And so baptism became a celebration of the fact that someone had made that decision. But it was never meant to be that way, and it never was that way for the first 1,500 years of Christianity. But now, at the time of the Reformation, having changed the definition of conversion, turning it into a logical decision rather than a lifestyle change, and having disconnected conversion from sanctification, and then having changed the very definition of baptism itself into something that commemorates a past event, like a personal decision, some Protestants started looking for justification for their new definitions in the scriptures. And they claimed that there are no infant or child baptisms in the New Testament. But is that true? The answer is no, it is not true, not at all. First, let's look at Peter's sermon in the book of Acts. Now, this is the the first Christian sermon ever preached after Jesus himself. And it's basically an altar call, or should I say a water call, because it calls people to baptism. The people say, what must we do to be saved? And what does Peter say? Does he say, make a personal decision to accept Jesus? No. He says, first, repent. And by the way, I know you have been told that the word repent means to change your mind, 
But it does not mean change your mind as in make a logical decision. It means turn your life around. It means choose a radically new lifestyle. And so then Peter says, you have to be baptized. And then he says this, he says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this is the promise for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Notice that the forgiveness comes in the baptism. That's the promise. And the promise is for you and your children. Now, before you object that your children means their descendants, think about this. On the day of Pentecost, when everyone thought Jesus was coming back soon, certainly within their lifetimes, would Peter really have in mind a second generation of Christians? I don't think so. I don't think Peter is looking out over that crowd and he sees a little child and he thinks, wow, I can't wait till that kid grows up so he can be baptized. No, Peter looks out over the crowd and sees a little child and thinks, Jesus is coming back before this kid grows up, so we better get this kid baptized now. So when you see this and you see the family baptisms in Acts chapter 16, and when you understand the culture of the ancient family and the household, you know you can't deny that children were being baptized from the beginning. Remember that the original church did believe in vicarious faith. Vicarious faith means one person's faith can stand in for another. One person can be baptized on the basis of another's faith. I mean, look, Jairus' daughter and the centurion's servant are healed on the basis of vicarious faith. It wasn't their faith that healed them. It was the faith of the, the father or the centurion. And if a dead person can be baptized on the basis of another's faith, then surely an infant or a child can be baptized on the basis of the parent's faith and on their sponsors and on their commitment to raise the child in the faith. But really, the bigger picture is this. The real reason why vicarious faith applies to baptism and the real reason why you can and should baptize infants and children is that baptism is a work of God, not a work of humans. It is God doing something miraculous in that moment, not simply a human ritual that commemorates a past event. Baptism like all the sacraments, is a miracle. So, okay, it's true that the New Testament does not describe a lot of infant baptisms. But again, remember, there was no second generation church yet. This is not the church of American evangelical individualism where individuals make logical decisions to commit to one thing or another. This is a church that sees itself as a family, including the children. People were converted and got baptized in groups, groups including people of all ages. So the argument against infant baptism, it's kind of an argument from silence, and it's not even a good one of those because the New Testament is really not silent. There are some family baptisms in the book of Acts, and yet there's less evidence in the New Testament for, let's say, lay people owning their own Bibles and reading it for themselves. Now this gets us back to the question of how we read the Bible. You cannot read the Bible as though something not mentioned is therefore prohibited. Because if you're going to say that you can't baptize infants because the New Testament doesn't seem to command infant baptism, well then you would also have to say that you can't have home Bible studies unless you have the bishop there. The truth is, no one in the original church ever criticized infant baptism. The age of the recipient of baptism was never a criterion for a valid baptism. I should mention that the method of applying water was also never a criterion for validity. It did not matter whether the person was fully immersed or the water was poured or sprinkled. 
All that was required was the use of water and the name of the Trinity. Now, I know Peter says baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, but that's just a shorthand because Jesus himself commanded his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the original church, the question was not whether or not to baptize infants. Actually, the only question was, should we wait eight days uh, until after the baby is born, like the way the uh, Jewish believers wait eight days to circumcise? But the question of infant baptism per se really only comes up later as a part of the controversy over Pelagianism and the question of original sin. Now, I'm going to have another video on original sin later, but for now, notice this. In the condemnation of Pelagius as a heretic, part of the reason was that he seemed to be saying that infants did not need baptism. And so you see, Pelagius was called a heretic in part for rejecting infant baptism. In the context of that Pelagian controversy, St. Augustine describes infant baptism as necessary because of original sin. And again, I'll have a video on original sin later, but the point is he's assuming that it's being done and that it's normal. And so to discontinue infant baptism is like saying that the Pelagians were right. And so if you say that we don't see infant baptism in the New Testament, well, there's really three things going on. Number one, ignoring the evidence of family baptisms, like in Acts chapter 16. People got baptized in groups and in families, and those absolutely would have included children. Number two, it's kind of a leap of logic because uh, there was no second generation church yet, at least not until the very latest uh, documents in the New Testament. And so you can't argue that, oh, there's no infant baptism in the New Testament. Why would there be very many? Because we, we don't have a second generation church yet. And number three, it's basically an argument from silence without studying the context. And I've said this before, you can't study the New Testament without also studying the original church, the context for the New Testament. Now, if you want an argument from a lack of evidence, here's one. The truth is, there is no evidence of any age restrictions on baptism ever for the first 1500 years of the church. So you have to ask yourself, are all of those infant and child baptisms invalid? Did Christianity just begin with the third wave of the Protestant Reformation over 1500 years after the apostles? No. Did the original church do infant baptism? Yes, of course it did. They believed that the church was a family that welcomed children, and they believed that baptism was a sacrament of grace which gets you started on your journey toward God. And you need that grace to begin that journey no matter how old you are. And they believed that no one should be denied the grace of baptism, especially not the vulnerable, the infants and the children. And so that's how it was in the original church. I'll see you next time. Cheers. Hey, thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I really appreciate that. Please share this video with your friends and please join me in the original church community on locals.com. Don't forget that if you join the original church community on locals.com, you can join me each week for a live, in-depth, chronological Bible study. It's live streamed every Saturday, but you can watch it later if you're not available. So join me for that and I'll see you there. I hope to see you there. I hope to see you there and I'll see you there.